Well, good morning. It's 5 a.m. on Monday, the 8th of February. Before we start, can I thank you all for your prayers and your support during my kidney transplant journey over Friday and Saturday. And the fact that it uh, didn't turn out successfully hasn't been a bit of disappointment, but has actually filled me with, me with more hope and uh, has given me a dummy run to know what happens. And I, I, I approach now the next time with, with great confidence. So thank you very much for your love and support. I really, really felt it. So today we're looking at Mark's Gospel, chapter 13. And as we said in the introduction of this, about a week or so ago now, that uh, Barclay is, is taking sections of chapter 13 and putting them together so that they carry a similar theme. And so today we're looking at chapter 13, verses 3 to 6 and 21 to 23. And reading from the Who Bible, it says this. Take a good long look, said Jesus. The day will come when this awesome temple will be reduced to a pile of rubble. They climbed the Mount of Olives and sat looking back across at the Temple Mount. Peter, James, John and Andrew took Jesus aside. Verse 21 onwards. Don't drop your guard. While all this is happening, if anyone says, look, the Saviour has returned. Don't believe it for a moment. Fake saviours and prophets will be ten a penny. They'll dazzle people with miracles. Anything to fool my chosen ones. Don't listen. I'm warning you. Now, so that you don't get caught out. So Barclay heads this, the, the danger of the last days. And he says that Jesus was well aware that before the end, heretics would arise. And indeed, it was not long before the church had its heretics. And Barclay gives us five bullet points of what causes heresy. The first one, he says, it arises from constructing doctrine to suit oneself. The human mind has an infinite capacity for wishful thinking. In a famous sentence, the psalmist said, Fools say in their hearts, there is no God, Psalm 14.1. The fools about whom the psalmist was speaking were not fools in the sense that they had no intelligence. They were moral fools. The statement there is that there was no God was made because they didn't wish God to be. If God existed, so much the worse for them. Therefore, they eliminated him from their doctrine and from their universe. One particular heresy has always been with us, and it's called antinomianism. And antinomians begin with the principle that the law has been abolished. And in a sense, they're right. They go on to say that there's nothing but grace. And again, in a sense, they're right. They then go on to argue, as Paul shows us in Romans 6, on the lines like these. You say that God's grace is wide enough to forgive any sin? Yes. You say that God's grace is the greatest and the most wonderful thing in the universe? Yes. Then they conclude, well, let's go on sinning in our hearts content for the more we sin, the more chances we give God's amazing grace to operate. Sin is a good thing, for sin gives grace a chance to work. Therefore, let us do whatever we like. The grace of God has been twisted to suit those who want to sin. Secondly, heresy arises from the overstressing of one part of the truth. For instance, if we, you know, we, we try and overstress one attribute of God, we only think of God's holiness and we're never going to obtain any intimacy with him, but rather tend to deism in which he is entirely remote from the world, the absent landlord, as I was taught on my theology course. Heresy arises from trying to produce a religion which will suit people, one that is popular and attractive. But to do that, it's got to be watered down. Heresy arises from divorcing ourselves from Christian fellowship. 
Anyone who thinks alone runs a grave danger of thinking astray. There is such a thing as the tradition of the church, and there is such a conception as the church being the guardian of the truth. If people find that their thinking separates them from the fellowship of others, the chances are there is something wrong with their thinking. And heresy arises from the attempt to be completely intelligible. Here's one of the great paradoxes. We're duty-bound to try and understand our faith. But because we're finite and God is infinite, we can never fully understand. So I, I scribbled a few notes down myself that Jesus never gave us a get-out-of-jail-free card. Because we must give account of what we have done to God at the end. And we will be judged by God. Yes, there is, thankfully, grace. And grace has been summed up as God's redemption at Christ's expense. So watch out for imposters, Jesus tells us. Watch out for these false messages. And I wanted to finish with the verses of a hymn, which actually came into my head when I was thinking about hope, which is what I'm preaching at Cornerstone on the 28th of February, online on Zoom. Lord of all hopefulness, Lord of all joy, whose trust ever childlike no cares could destroy, be there at our waking and give us, we pray, your bliss in our hearts, Lord, at the break of the day. And here we are at 5.09, the break of the day. Lord of all eagerness, Lord of all faith, whose strong hands were skilled at the plain and the lathe, be there at our labours and give us, we pray, your strength in our hearts, Lord, at the noon of the day. And wow, did I feel God's strength in my heart and I pray today that that strength is in your hearts today. Lord of all kindliness, Lord of all grace, God's redemption at Christ's expense. Your hands swift to welcome, your arms to embrace. Be there at our homing when we come and meet with God and give us, we pray, your love in our hearts, Lord, at the eve of the day. And Lord of all gentleness, Lord of all calm, whose voice is contentment, whose presence is balm. Be there at our sleeping and give us, we pray, your peace in our hearts, Lord, at the end of the day. And Lord, I pray that each one of us has the peace of the Lord in our hearts today. God bless and thank you again.